Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck and Jerry's here, too, and this is Stuff You Should Know. Um, And this is the somebody gives out even worse advice than we do edition. (laughs) Uh, I'm glad you picked this one. Thanks. Do you have any history with the anarchist cookbook? Yes. Did you have a copy of it? Yes. I could have told you that. Did you? <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, I guess first we should just tell people we're talking about a book called The Anarchist Cookbook, uh, mm-hmm. published in 1971, that was, uh, or that is rather, a book that uh, contains everything from like how to make your own LSD to how to find mushrooms to how to make a bomb. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, Dave points out that it was sort of a dorm room special and I did not have one, but, uh, you know, I had a couple of friends that had it and it was just one of those things that were like, Hey, got the anarchist cookbook. It meant you were like just an alternative thinker. And, uh, I mean, it's very silly thinking back. Yeah. Uh, and I think most of my friends that had it, it was all about like the drug stuff. It wasn't, uh, they weren't like bomb makers, (laughs) you know? Right. Yeah, I actually hadn't even fully realized that there was like bomb making instructions in yeah. there. Um yeah, so it's a it's almost like a I've seen it described as a book of forbidden knowledge. Yeah. It's yeah, got yeah. such a bad reputation that um it's in any court case I was reading about this, in any court case where the book has been confiscated as contraband, not a single judge has ruled that that was illegal. They're like, yeah get that book away from them. That's a terrible book. And uh, it's also frequently or has been in the past used as circumstantial evidence to help prove cases against people suspected of crimes. They were also caught with the anarchist cookbook in their house and that was used against them in their trials. Yeah. And I think in the UK, I was trying to find specific uh, incidents of this, but I'm pretty sure in the UK, at least for a while, like it was, uh, if you got caught with it, or maybe if it was if, if something had gone wrong and you got caught with it, it was an extra mm-hmm. charge or something. I'm not I'm not sure if it was officially banned there. It was kind of hard to a little murky. Yeah. But so, I mean, in, in the real world, this book has been used in plots that have resulted in real life deaths. Like yeah. Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber, he uh, had a copy. A guy named Thomas Spinks, who bombed 10 abortion clinics in the 80s. He had a copy. The Boston Marathon bombers, they had copies. The Columbine shooters, they had a copy. Like, if it even if it didn't directly teach them how to blow people up necessarily, it was still an inspirational book for them, right? And um, the the craziest part about this whole thing is that these people were buying fully into a book written by an angry 19-year-old who went on to grow up very shortly after the publication of Mm -hmm. his book and denounced it almost immediately. Yeah, and uh, a book that was, you know, kind of a a copy-paste fest of mostly information that was uh, readily available. In fact, I would say completely. I don't think anything that he put in there was something that was, like, truly forbidden No. Uh, Like you could find all this stuff out because this kid found all this stuff out and just compiled it. Yeah. Even the the literal recipe for LSD was copied and pasted from the Eli Lilly patent that describes in depth, like anybody can buy the anarchist cookbook or go online and figure out exactly how to how to make LSD based on these instructions. If you know what you're talking about, chemistry, (laughs) that's a big caveat. But I mean, it's not like so. Yes, every single part in this book was already was accessible, but it was presented, at least by the publisher, as, you know, again, this book of forbidden, repressed knowledge that yeah, yeah. needs to be gotten in the hands of every American so that we can stage an actual revolution and take back our country from the forces of, you know, evil. Yeah, pretty funny. <laughs> I mean, not funny because it's yeah. it's been used, but uh, just dorks like you and I having it around us in college is sort of an embarrassing trope, you know? I had mine in high school. 
Uh, oh, of course, you are you're ahead of the game, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So um, this book has been, two, two million copies of the Anarchist Cookbook has been sold uh, in the, I guess, 50, yeah, more than 50 years since it was first published. Uh, and it, it came from, again, an angry 19-year-old whose background and then also the backdrop that he wrote this book in really kind of inform what yeah. you need to know about the Anarchist Cookbook. Yeah, totally. As far as his background, his name is William Powell. Uh, he was born uh, in the States but moved to uh, England when he was three, uh, son of a philosophy professor. Uh, his father would um, was a philosophy teacher and then would go on to uh, work as, in leadership at the UN. Uh, his mom was a therapist. They weren't like, you know, these uh, radicals kind of enforcing their opinions on their son. Uh, he was just a regular kid who moved to England. Uh, kind of didn't fit in there because he was bullied for being an American. Uh, then when he came back from England, he was bullied for having a little bit of an English accent by Americans in mm -hmm. White Plains, New York. And uh, apparently even like teachers would make fun of his accent and stuff and tease him. So he, he started getting pretty angry early on, started getting in with a bad crowd and skipping school and busting cars. And um, yeah, eventually I believe they sent him to a boarding school. Uh, where he was expelled after he, he drove a teacher's ditch into a car, or I guess put it in neutral and pushed it. Yeah, a car into a ditch. Um, yeah. That'll get you expelled pretty much every time. Um, he also said that he was molested during this time as well at the boarding school. So, <clears throat> like, he had a lot of reason to be angry. This stuff, like, really impacted him. And he also said later on, he became an educator, which is pretty amazing considering what we're about to describe him doing as a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, but he believes, looking back, that he had an undiagnosed learning disability that made it, on top of all like the social mistreatment, made his academic career like that much harder and frustrating as well. So you put all that together, you have a kid who's ripe for um, being antisocial, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Uh, he eventually would go to New York City when he was 17 uh, on his own and lived on the Lower East Side, East Village area in the Bowery. Uh, and in the 1960s, this was 67, uh, you talked about sort of what was going on around him. This was a, a New York that was uh, in the middle of um, protesting Vietnam. Uh, he was even, you know, attempted to be drafted at least. Uh, to go to Vietnam and fight, but he showed up uh, drunk and stoned uh, at the draft board, hoping to get out of it, uh, which I guess he did, right? He did. I think he was interviewed four different times before they gave him a, a Section 4F. Yeah, which is what he, he wanted. It's exactly what he wanted. And this is another thing. <clears throat> this is part of that backdrop that I was referring to that was really important to understand. This was a time where if you were uh, like a there was, a, I think, a 20-something year window in age. If you were this in, in that window, if that's how old you were, there was a chance that you were going to be forced to go fight in Vietnam and possibly die or, and possibly kill other people. And this was reality. And a lot of people were not okay with that. So this, this pushing back on that whole sentiment um, kind of formed this basis of, like, this revolutionary, mm -hmm. you know, sense that like this, the stakes were so high for what could happen to you if, if the government just insouciantly decided you're going over there now that the, to the people who were opposed to it, there's like there's no response to this except for a bloody revolution. Yeah, exactly. So uh, his, you know, sort of living situation certainly didn't uh, quell any of this. He was um, roommate to a guy named Steve Hancock, who was the older brother of one of his former uh, boarding school pals. And he was a, a genuine, like, uh, anarchist, Steve right. Hancock was. He managed a bookstore called Bookmasters, uh, got uh, William Powell a job there. Um, he started digging into, you know, all those sort of revolutionary um, guidebooks, like from Che Guevara and, and Abby Hoffman and other, um, you know, supposed anarchist leaders of the time. Uh, and Steve Hancock was a big influence on him. He was sort of, uh, he was a member of the Industrial Workers of the World. I think we've talked about them at some point. 
Yeah, Eugene Maybe. Debs was one of the founding members. Remember yeah. him? He he ran for president as a socialist from prison. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So Hancock was a member of this group, and he told William Powell about this idea for distributing flyers, about making LSD, about making uh, Molotov cocktails, and that was what the original anarchist cookbook was going to be. From Powell, once he kind of launched into this thing, was just a series of flyers. But it kind of quickly escalated to book level. Okay, cool. So um, just one more thing about him working at Bookmasters. Uh, apparently, he met Valerie Solange, the woman who shot Andy Warhol, oh, yeah. uh, when she came around peddling copies of her Scum Manifesto. And he was like, I like this, and actually got a few copies and put them in the window. Yeah. Isn't that nuts? I think this is a week <laughs> before she shot Andy Warhol, too. Well, that all totally tracks with his sort of state of mind at the time, you know? Yeah, and speaking of state of mind, so he is um, completely hooked on speed at this time. He's doing tons of drugs, just living the anarchist, anti-government, anti-war lifestyle um, in New York, which was, I don't know if you said it or not, this was basically like the center of the anti-war movement in 1967, 68, right? Yeah. And like... This whole idea, I, I, I should say not everybody, I said earlier, everybody who was opposed to it was like, the only way you can solve this is a bloody revolution. Not true. There was a lot of peaceful activism that did not think that. But the people, there was a lot more militancy than, say, you'll see today in America. Mm -hmm. It was inspired by the idea that you could be drafted and sent to kill people and be killed. And those people were the ones who were like, we need to, we need to overthrow the government. And so that's what... William Powell was essentially doing when he sat down to write this book, he wanted to put the information or if you put it all together, you could overthrow the government or start a revolution into the hands of as many people as possible. And that's that was the, the anarchist cookbook that he sat down and wrote. Or like you said, he sat down and copied and pasted. Yeah, he wrote a lot, too. Um, sure. And maybe we'll get to some of that actual writing after a break. Sure. All right. We'll be right back. All right. So uh, Powell decides to put this book together. Uh, he goes to the New York Public Library. Uh, library. I said it like I was seven years old. Mm -hmm. Started researching uh, this book. And because he, you know, uh, hopefully we've made it clear that this guy was not a weapons expert and didn't know how to make bombs and was no. not a guerrilla fighter or a true revolutionary. He was uh, he was sort of inspired to collect this information. Uh, and the foreword of the book uh, kind of says it all here, uh, which he wrote. Uh, this is a book for the people of the United States of America. It is not written for the members of fringe political groups such as the Weathermen or the Minutemen. Uh, those radical groups don't need this book. They already know everything that's in here. And the real, if the real people of America, the silent majority, are going to survive, they must educate themselves. That is the purpose of this book. Yeah. So there you have it. So um, you said that he had, like, zero experience in guerrilla warfare, hand-to-hand -hand <laughs> combat, making bombs, um, um, converting, like, weapons into other newer, deadlier types of weapons. Yeah. But if you read his writing, he sounds like he's been there, done that, and now he's come to tell you how yeah. to do it yourself. That's the way yeah. it reads. He sounds like a total tough guy. And when you st step back and, and realize, like, no, this guy just— did a lot of research and then presented it as if he knew what he was talking about. It oh actually gosh. is kind of funny. <laughs> yes, but we don't pretend like. No, no, no. Like we've done, you know, like we haven't like hung out with porcupines or, right. um, you know. <laughs> We're always clear about that. <laughs> we've never, we've never, you know, uh, it, it, given our expertise on economic policy to any government. Like. Thank goodness. Yes. Yeah, we're not experts, right? So yeah. this guy, he presented, William Powell presented himself as an expert. And that's just how the book reads. But when you step back and think about it like that, it's actually kind of funny. Some of the stuff that's in there, like one thing he did do was draw a lot of stuff. And he's, yeah. he wasn't a very good artist to begin with. But one of the pictures that stood out to me, <laughs> and this is only funny if you look at it a certain way. It's also very much not funny. 
But yeah. there's a, a section on garrots or garrots. I can't I can't remember how you pronounce it, which is two pieces of wood that you hold in your hands and then a piece of like piano wire b- between them. And you strangle mm-hmm. somebody with this. And there's a drawing that I guess William Powell did of somebody, you know, strangling a guy. He's coming at him from behind with his knee in his back, like strangling him with the garrot. Mm-hmm. And um, just the way that this, this picture reads and all this, the text around it, is just the idea that this kid had never done or even seen anything like that, but is presenting it like this is how you do it. it it's it's just so preposterous and ridiculous that people actually took this seriously. It'd be like taking life or death advice from Holden Caulfield, basically. Yeah, was there a, uh, I didn't see that drawing. Was there a speech bubble that said, <laughs> <laughs> Pretty, pretty much, <laughs> yeah. There, It was implied, for sure. Okay. <laughs> One other thing that stuck out to me too, Chuck, was he would just toss out percentages very confidently. And if you stop and read it, you're like, I don't think that's true. One of them was if in hand-to-hand combat, first of all, you fight to the death. That's how you fight hand-to-hand combat. You're you're not trying to knock the guy out. That was a piece of advice in this. But he also says that if you can get your opponent knocked off balance, you— Nine to one, you can kill him in the next move. So nine times out of ten, your next move is going to kill the guy. Where where did that percentage come from? Where did that ratio come from? You can just tell he's just making this stuff up. And um, it, it, when you take it like that, he just made all of it up, essentially. And the stuff he didn't make up, he, like you said, just copied and pasted from legitimate sources, which is what really actually made the book dangerous. Yeah. Or, I mean, at the very least— he may have gotten that from someone who made that up, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, who knows? Uh, so there uh, are a lot of different things you can, you know, we've kind of mentioned a few of the things. There's a lot of drug stuff, uh, like we mentioned how to make LSD and uh, how to uh, generate uh, psychedelic mushrooms and stuff. Um, but there's also a lot of, you know, uh, weapon stuff, um, how to kill somebody with piano wire and two pieces of wood. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you mentioned, how to uh, how to modify guns, like how to make your own silencer or how to convert a shotgun into a grenade launcher. That was a big one. Uh, yeah, that was a real big one. And this is the stuff that like, you know, in the, I guess, maybe since the 60s, but at least in the 90s was was my experience. And it sounds like yours is when you know, your friend had it on the bookshelf and they're like, look at this, man, you know, check this out. Mm -hmm. And it was never like, let's build a silencer for uh, a pistol. No, none of us had pistols. It was just like, check this thing out, man. Like, this is a dangerous book. Yeah. And let's do some nutmeg and smoke some banana peels because this book is saying. (laughs) Yeah, that was in there too. Pretty buzzed from it. Yeah, yeah. That was, yeah. So um, if you've ever heard of smoking banana peels, it's, this isn't where it came from. It, the Anarchist Cookbook cribbed it from, I think, the Berkeley Barb, some alternative newsletter, um, yeah. like a couple of years before. Smoking banana peels was all the rage in like 1967. And then everybody finally figured out it doesn't do a, a thing to you. Uh, it was all just basically a hoax, but it made it yeah, pretty Or far. more expensive than just buying weed. <laughs> yeah. You need like 200 bananas or yeah. something. <laughs> but allegedly it gave you like a totally different trip than weed or LSD. Oh, sure. So, you know, the hippies were like, let's try anything we can. And then nutmeg actually does have psychedelic properties, but you have to take so much of it that you would just be hating life um, from taking that much nutmeg. Do you remember the other one? I'm sure this got around was the uh, toothpaste on a cigarette. Yeah. And bleach. You had to mix it with bleach. Oh, so see, I didn't know that part. No wonder it never did anything. <laughs> toothpaste and bleach. Yeah. Which that doesn't do anything either. Yeah, by the way, don't try any of this dumb stuff that we're kind of jokingly reminiscing about hearing. Uh, It was a dumb thing to uh, hear back then and spread around, and it certainly is now. So none of all of this stuff is is very much not recommended. Yeah, that's you saying that reminds me of um, there's this great line from Malcolm in the Middle where (laughs) I can't remember his mom's name, but his mom was like scolding his dad about, like, filling the kids' heads with all of these stories uh-huh. of, like, misspent youth. And his dad goes, those are cautionary tales. And she said, cautionary tales don't end with, it was so cool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a good show. It really was a great show. 
Uh, but speaking of cautionary, uh, there there was uh, he did you know lay out a little caution here and there. Uh, use care, caution, common sense. This book is not for children or morons. Mm-hmm. Uh, was one of even though plenty of children and morons got it into their hands. <laughs> um, but he you know he he was a uh, sort of a dramatic writer. He uh, I, I don't I'm not going to say that he was like untalented as a writer. Um, but it's kind of hard to judge the book on those terms at all, even, you know? Yeah, and I don't think a single writer in the history of the world has ever looked back at what they wrote at 19 and was like, this is great. Oh, God. Yeah, You know, totally. it's always mm. cringy. So considering that he was 19 when he wrote it, it's actually pretty good writing. Yeah, no, good point. So, um, yeah, like you said, he did issue some warnings and, and that kind of thing. Not necessarily as like a COA. I don't get the impression that William Powell ever even considered um covering his own rear no or that i don't even know how much he thought about this stuff ahead of time like people actually doing some of the stuff you know yeah i i don't know if he he just if it was like an like a bit of a lark like that where he was like i'm just gonna do this and didn't think it through or if he actually was like really trying to help people yeah. start a revolution i'm i'm not exactly sure which way it went but from what I've seen, most people cite that he was actually quite serious when he when he wrote this book. Yeah, for sure. Um, but the you know they call it a cookbook. There were a lot of kind of um, quote unquote cookbooks that some featured real recipes for things, but some didn't. It was more like a collection kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, this had plenty of recipes for druggy stuff: um, pot brownies, uh, marijuana butter, uh, how to make marijuana mints, and so there were genuine. Uh, sort of drug-based recipes in there. Yeah. But just because if you've never heard of the Anarchist Cookbook, it is not just like a cookbook, obviously. No. Uh, he also had warnings against sniffing glue or shooting heroin, yeah. which is pretty sensible and level-headed. Yeah, look at that kid. So we put all this together, and I think it's like a couple hundred pages, right? I remember it yeah. being semi-thick and like large large page format, right? Yeah, I think so. That's what they call it in the publishing world, right? Large page yeah. <laughs> format? <laughs> yeah, you really just wanted to have it, the spine showing yeah. on your bookshelf. Yeah, or when you carried it around campus, like you made sure that your arm wasn't covering the title. Right. <laughs> oh, man, I never saw anyone actually carrying them around. So um, he, he, he tried to enter the publishing world with this manuscript. He sent it to 30 different houses. He got 30 different rejection letters. Um, some like, what is wrong with you? Others like, this isn't quite the fit with our right. ethos. Um, and then somehow, some way, he came into contact with a guy named Lyle Stewart. And Lyle Stewart was a publisher who just basically wanted to be a provocative publisher. And the anarchist cookbook just fell into his lap. And he was like, thank you, God. Um, and he ran with it. Oh, yeah, big time. Um he didn't change a word. He was like, this is perfect as it is. Yeah. Uh, all your drawings are great. You're such a good little drawer boy. <laughs> uh, and he just, he wanted it. I, I think he loved this, the idea that, um, the idea of the book. And I think any thoughts to changing it were uh, quickly squashed in his mind of like, no, sort of the genius of this book, to him at least, mm-hmm. was just how taboo it was. And uh, it, it should look like, you know, crazy rantings. Uh, because one, there's a quote from him uh, that I think is pretty um, telling of like who this guy is mm-hmm. and also kind of smart for a book publisher sure. was that uh, I'm paraphrasing, but like people don't buy a bestseller like this to read it. They buy it to, to have it and just show it on the bookshelf. Exactly. To carry it around campus. Yeah. <laughs> with your arm not covering up the title. <laughs> so um, with, with in the hands of Lyle Stewart, like the, this book would take on its life finally, right? It would go from the rantings of a a 19-year-old kid to a legitimately published book that was also heavily promoted by a guy who knew how to just play the media to get free exposure, essentially. And so he held a um, a press conference where uh, somebody supposedly an uh, angry anarchist who um, was mad that this kid was sharing this forbidden information with the world threw a smoke bomb into the press conference and everybody like like jumped for cover. And William Powell later said that he noticed that Lyle Stewart 
didn't duck or anything like that. He just kept his his position behind the podium during the press conference, pretty much. (laughs) And he was like, Lyle Stewart was just the kind of guy who would who would think to stage something like that just to just to show how seriously anarchistic this book was during the press conference. Like that's yeah. the kind of promotion that this book got from him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you're wondering like, all right, where is uh, our old friend J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI and all this? Mm-hmm. Uh, they were on it uh, big time. They, they took this book seriously. Um, they, uh, you know, You used to hear rumors, again, these are probably just rumors that never happened about, like, there was a list, and, like, where'd you buy it from? And, like, did you use a credit card? That kind of thing. Mm Because now you're on a list if you own a copy of this thing. Uh, It probably didn't go that far, but uh, they did question uh, his parents. Uh, They questioned his dad's colleagues at the UN. They never questioned Powell, um, like, sat him down in person because they thought it would you know, it would hit the news. What they what they wanted to do was kind of quash this thing without giving it even more publicity. Right. Um, but that didn't stop the media from running with it, for sure. Um, there was a, a headline that Dave, who helped us with this, he dug up from UPI <clears throat> that said, new anarchist cookbook contains recipe for sabotage, destruction. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so as people are reading this, they become genuinely scared of this book. So like you said, J. Edgar Hoover is in charge of the FBI. I don't know if we said it or not, but it was published at the beginning in 1971. So Richard Nixon is president. This yeah. is not a time where people were cool with free speech when it came to, you know, making bombs and stuff like that. Um, so everybody was like, you guys need to investigate this and, and just get rid of this. People were literally sending clippings of like book reviews um, to J. Edgar Hoover with like notes written in the margin. I think one was danger exclamation point what are you going to do about this yeah. and what's astounding to me is not a single head got cracked as far as i can tell and in fact the fbi was like we've investigated it and this is all protected by the first amendment as as, yeah. as re- reprehensible as we think it is yeah which is you know uh, a real victory in a way again as as dumb as a book as it ended up being uh, it is a victory for free speech in this country to not have the government, even at that time. Yeah, especially at uh, that time. Yeah, come in and like put their neck on everyone's throat, which is kind of surprising. Yeah, it's surprising. And it's also ironic because it was exactly that kind of like censorship mentality that William Powell was raging against. Yeah. He tested it and the system, the establishment actually passed. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. They're they like, we're going to protect your crummy book, you little revolutionary yokel. <laughs> Uh, should we take another break? Yeah. All right. I think any time you say the word yokel, that's our cue. <laughs> it is. All right. We'll be right back and talk about kind of uh, when this book was in the wrong hands. What happened right after this? All right, Chuck. So you said this book ended up in the wrong hands. I guess we said at the very outset that it did. So it's not really a big twist in the story. But uh, I think the first time l- blood was actually shed, like life was lost because of the anarchist cookbook, or at least in part, was uh, in September of 1976, when a group of Croatian independence guerrillas hijacked a flight from New York to Chicago and was like, this plane's going to Paris now. And they were like, do you know how many refueling stops we're going to have to make? And they said, we don't yeah. care. Just do it. And supposedly, as far as hijackings go, it was really polite. I think some of the people who were actually hostages later told the press, like, it was almost ridiculous how polite and apologetic these these um, terrorists were. Um, and it turned out that the bombs they had strapped to themselves were like silly putty, an alarm yeah. clock were not bombs, but one of the demands that they had was that the the like Washington Post and some of the other papers had to print their manifesto or else they would set off a real bomb at Grand Central Station. And that one actually did turn out to be real. Yeah. Um, the bomb squad came in uh, from New York City's finest. Uh, very sadly, one person was killed. Officer Brian Murray uh, was killed trying to defuse the bomb. A few other people were injured. Uh, upon being charged, the hijackers said, we 
we got this information on how to make this bomb from the anarchist cookbook. Mm-hmm. And that was the first case, like you said, of like real bloodshed happening. Uh, but but not the first, um, you know, like you mentioned, this was found on every not every, but like it seems like any time you heard about someone uh, committing some awful violent act against either a lot of people or planning something like this, mm-hmm. uh, this was sort of the the one of the textbooks that they had on their shelf. Exactly. Um, and by this time, so this is 1976, William Powell had completely transformed into a different, again, more grown up person. Um, yeah. He became an Anglican. He became religious that same year. By that time, he'd already gone off to college, graduated, worked in Alaska, um, discovered his his true love of educating kids with learning disabilities, like what yeah. he would keep doing for the rest of his life. And um, so when this when it came out that like this is this is actually like now like costing people their lives, he um, he was very upset about that. He wanted to distance him, himself from the book. Um, the problem was, as we'll see, he never owned the copyright. In addition to knowing exactly how to promote controversial material, Lyle Stewart also knew how to rip off his authors, too. So he owned the copyright to the Anarchist Cookbook. Um, William Powell just got a couple thousand dollars from it and then said, OK, see you later. Yeah, he well, a couple of thousand dollars up front. I think he said he ended up making about 50 grand in royalties over the years. Mm. Uh, and that was despite him wanting to pull it from print. Uh, there was a period of about uh, 11 years where it was out of print. Um, you know, by this point, like in the 90s, uh, he, he was moving sort of all over the world with his wife, uh, teaching in the Middle East, teaching in Africa, uh, really doing great work. Yeah. Um, but in 91, a couple of things happened. He was appointed by um, uh, or appointed as a CEO of an international school in uh, Tanzania. And parents complained and were like, hey, do you know who this guy is? He wrote the Anarchist Cookbook. And they, you know, they protested. It was, it was an anonymous letter to the board, and they protested his hiring. Ironically, it was that same year that the book actually went out of print for a little while, which is what he wanted more than anything. Um, in 91, it was bought by a guy, a publisher uh, named Stephen uh, Shragus. And he was a, you know, I'm not sh- sure how big time he was, but apparently he had a couple of thousand books uh, that he was publishing uh, over this 11 year period. And that was not one of them. He bought the rights and then sat on it and said, you know, the public shouldn't have this. And I agree with him. Uh, oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. So it was like an 11 year period where, you know, it was out of print. You could still buy it, of course, uh, if you knew someone who had it or if it was in a bookstore or something. It's not like it was banned. But sure. he he pulled it for a little over a decade. Wow. Um, I think something that's good to know about William Powell, too, by this time, uh, you said he got forced out of his position as CEO of that international school in Tanzania um, for being the author of the Anarchist Cookbook. Uh, very shortly after he departed, the board got back in touch with him and was like, please come back. Like, we, we don't care about this. We're, we, we, we like what you're doing so much. We want you to come back. So he came back for eight more years as the head of that school. I think yeah. that says quite a bit. Totally. I don't know. Did you watch the documentary? No, I haven't. It's good. There's a documentary called American Anarchist that like you just you really feel for this guy because it's a situation where everyone does something dumb or or many things that are dumb when they're teenagers. And uh, most of us are able to escape those and leave those firmly in the past and Mm -hmm. move on and grow up like everyone does. And this was a guy that was really doing great work and really, really, really had so much regret about this book. But there was just there was it was there was nothing he could do about it. And you could feel this guy's pain of like, my name is tied to this thing. I just wish it would go away. Uh, But you never felt like, well, like sometimes like, yeah, but you did it. So you deserve it. Um, Oh, you never felt like that? No, I always felt really bad for the guy with the interviews because, man. Because he just went on to do such great work in special ed and, like, really turned things around and uh, kind of had this stamp on him for the rest of his life. He had a hard time getting work, you know, a lot of times. That's yeah. one reason he kept kind of moving around. Man, that is really sad. So he's a very empathetic figure, huh? Uh, that's how he came across to me. Or I guess sympathetic figure. So, yeah. um yeah, one reason why he, he was just, like, in agony, I guess, over this book 
him not being able to do anything about this book is because after that Croatian separatist um, incident, like it, it ended up inspiring more violence, like more real world violence throughout the 80s and the 90s. I mean, from yeah. the beginning of the 80s to the end of the 90s, there were some really high profile um, mass murders um, that f- were carried out, like we said, by people who owned the anarchist cookbook. So in one way or another, they were inspired or even maybe directed in some cases um, in carrying out the the crimes that they committed, the atrocities yeah. even. Yeah, and he was putting out statements all along. He even uh, uh, contacted Amazon to try and get a message kind of permanently posted. Uh, the central idea of the book is was that violence is an acceptable means to bring about political change. I no longer agree with this. Uh, I want to state categorically I'm not in agreement with the contents of the Anarchist Cookbook, and I would be very pleased and relieved to see its publication discontinued. I consider it to be a misguided and potentially dangerous publication, uh, which should be taken out of print. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, there was nothing he could do about it because of Lyle Stewart. Yeah, not just Lyle Stewart, but after the guy who I guess sat on it, I think Lyle Stewart sought him out and bought it back. And it went back into print, and then Lyle Stewart sold it to another publishing house that is owns it now, that is keeping it in print as well. And the the thing to understand about this anarchist cookbook, it's like that Abby Hoffman steal this book thing. Like the right. idea of it being pirated is kind of part of its whole um, jam, you know. So yeah, yeah. There's so many like rip off, copycat published versions of it. Um, that you can buy on Amazon and other places, like, no problem. They're, like, illegitimate counterfeit copies of the Anarchist Cookbook, but it's still the Anarchist Cookbook. It's somebody else publishing it as if it's in the public domain. And then yeah. even if all those people stopped actually physically publishing it, it's all over the Internet now. Um, like, I was reading a PDF version of it on the Internet Archive. Like, it's just out there. The way Dave put it was perfect. The genie's out of the bottle. Like this yeah. information is out there now. And unfortunately, it'll probably continue to keep inspiring people into acts of violence because of that that spirit behind it, that the government is needs to be taken to task and overthrown and the people need to rise up. Yeah. And despite everything he tried to do, it just, he put it out there and it wouldn't go away. Uh, he passed away in 2016 and, um, you know, always had great regret about what he had put into the world. Yeah. There was one other thing. There was another um, statement he made after, I think, a, a, a school shooting where he drew parallels between the work he was doing and then the legacy of the book where he was saying, you know, he works with kids who have learning disabilities and these kids are alienated by their um, their disability, essentially. And he said, no child should have to earn the right to belong. And then he turns around and essentially empathizes with the kids who are, you know, reading his book and then going on and and shooting up their schools and and saying, like, these kids, I'm sure, are alienated and feel ostracized as well. And this book did not help them uh, in any way. It did the opposite, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he does seem like a, a pretty amazing guy. Um, I mean, just the work that he, he did afterward was, is pretty remarkable. I, I know he's like a, a internationally renowned educator, or he was. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, in some ways and, he made up for what he did. And I guess if there's anything to take away from this, if you're a young person, like we have always encouraged people to be bold and use their voice, but, uh, you know, maybe pump the brakes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> think about it. 10 years from now what you want do you want that attached to you 10 20 30 40 years from now right yeah if you're writing nonfiction that calls for violence um just stop and, and ask somebody is this a good idea right uh since chuck said right everybody you got anything else nope since chuck said right and then nope it's definitely time for listener mail yeah i'm gonna call this missed opportunities uh this is from uh, AR, or maybe just R. No, it's AR. Okay. Uh, AR is talking about our Would a Love Drug Be Ethical episode that just dropped, and uh, AR was a former musician and thinks we missed a lot of opportunities for band names and album titles. Okay, let's hear. All right, so here we go. Uh, you guys did mention uh, Savalesco and Earp as an 
organ saxophone combo. Mm-hmm. I don't remember that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were real gems in there, though, guys, like Lust Bucket. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Uh, Experimental Love Drug. Sure. Kind of on the nose. Uh, Electric Roses and Philosophers. <laughs> yeah. It's a little mouthy. Yeah. A little, little wordy. That sounds like an album title, then. If they're really wordy, it's usually an album title. Well, here's some album titles he, uh, or song titles he felt like we missed. Um, You're Not Good at Lovin'. <laughs> That's a great one. That needs a parenthetical, but like, you know, parentheses, but you really are. Right. Uh, Really low-key mellow stuff. Okay. Mm, I don't know about that. Uh, if You Dose Them. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Love Is Good Enough. That's a really good one. That's a great one. I love that. I can't believe there's not a song called that already. Yeah, well, there may be. AR points out that the genres on these guys run the gamut from EDM to country. Mm-hmm. And uh, really big fan of Turned On Friends and Family to the podcast. Just wanted to say, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks a lot, AR. That was a great email. We appreciate that big time. And as always, everybody, if we ever walk past a great band name or an album name or a song title or something like that, we want to hear from you, too. You can wrap it up, spank it on the bottom, and send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.